So since it is 7 o'clock, let us begin with prayer. O Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we love your word. But we must also admit that there are times that we don't always act like we love your word. So work in us that will and desire to make it our number one priority, that we might see you more clearly, that we might grow in our understanding and our faith, and that we might be able to say with the psalmist, the law from your mouth is more precious to us, more precious than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Amen. Psalm 119. So, we are on page 5 from our lesson from last week. If anyone should need extra sheets, I do have some extra sheets. But we are on page 5, looking at Romans 8, 10 to 14. And as we start off here, would someone like to read those verses? Go ahead, Brad. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who is dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh to live in harmony with it. For if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So last week we began our study here about our values and, and that need for us to evaluate our values and make sure they're matching up with our, our Savior's values and, and then to consider wh what are our values. We, we wrote that down, what our values are, but we also then said, okay, um, the time that we spend and the money that we spend, what is it saying about really what our values are? What does this passage and why is this text important to us as Christians attempting to live by God's values? We could probably say, say two things. One from, a, if you want to say, it's not negative side, but one from a, one, one way and one from a positive aspect of, of things. And there's a beautiful word in there, in there too, that I think is just a, a fascinating and instructive word for us. Um, Evan. Uh, because of righteousness, our spirit is uh, alive, but it, what is valued by the Christian and by faith and not what we normally value when we are in sin. So we are alive, and, and I think that's a huge, a huge point to keep in mind is that we are indeed alive, and therefore that means that we indeed can live a brand new life. Um, it's, it's that statement that I've been, I've been saying now for the last couple of weeks. You know, faith is a power. Faith is an enabling power. We do have this if we were to look at it maybe from the other angle then, is the aspect of saying we don't have to follow the values of the world. Um, and the word that I was speaking to is the one that says, so then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh. You don't owe anything to the sinful flesh. Uh, you know, and, and, and what, what maybe could we liken this to is, you know, the... the the, the people who, who grow up together um, and, and maybe they're, they're, they're childhood friends, they're high school, school friends, maybe they're college friends, and, and all along, you know, the, the one buddy has helped the other buddy out and then the other buddy helps the other buddy out and, and you get to the point of where you're growing up and one buddy has gone kind of the wrong path and the other buddy has gone the right path. Um, the, the one that's gone the right path does not owe it to the other buddy to go down the wrong path with him. 
Um, we don't owe it to the sinful flesh to live by it. Uh, we don't owe it anything. What a, what a beautiful way of, of saying it. You, you don't owe it anything. Correct. So that aspect, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. So guess who's living in you? Guess what is alive? The new man. Yeah. Because a lot of times that aspect of um, the body is the flesh. Um, and, the, and scripture uses that terminology quite frequently of the flesh referring to that, that nat sinful nature. Um, that body, that body of yours, that flesh of yours that, that you think um, should go along with these things, it's, it's dead. There's, there's a brand new life in you. Um, and it's just another way of saying, you know, where, where does your body go with you everywhere? Um, your, your, your body's dead, but you've got a brand new life in you. Live according to that life. Turn the page. Romans 13, 14. Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not give any thought to satisfying the desires of your sinful flesh. So what does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Mark. Okay. Uh, it, it, it is a challenge, but it is something that we are, we are able to do. Um, and, but you, you do, for, first and foremost, when it comes to that aspect of putting on um, our Lord Jesus Christ, is, is accepting by faith that righteousness that, that Christ has earned for us. Um, and, and we're only going to know that, as you rightfully say, is, is by means of the study of the Word and the Spirit working. That'd be part of the answer, yep. Um, it's accepting by faith the righteousness that, that he won for us. But it, it also, putting on, putting on Jesus Christ also means putting on the enabling power that he gives. You know, this is not just some vague term. This is not just some abstract term. This is not just some aspect of, you know, it's a nice picture, to put on Jesus Christ also means put on his power. And, and, and a way that you can picture this, a way that we can picture this is, you know, think about it. If you've got your, your best tuxedo on um, and you're going to your wedding or your best, the, the wedding dress and you're going to your wedding and, and you, you're about a quarter of a mile away from the, from the church and the car breaks down. So you got to walk the rest of the way to make sure you're not late. This is before cell phones. <laughs> and you get out of the car and you walk, whether it be along the side of the road or whether it be a, a case of, of um, walking across the field because it's the fastest way to get there. What do you do? You do absolutely everything within your power to make sure you don't get dirty. I've got the greatest, most important clothes that I've got on here, and I don't want my wedding dress dirty. I don't want my tuxedo dirty. So I take every care. I put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I put on his righteousness. Can you speak up to what you said just a minute ago when you answered that question? You said it so well. I said it, how do you know I said it well then? Um, low. You said it so well. Oh, so low. I thought you said it so, so well. Um, that it, it, it is really everything that I've said, but if we were to put it into really specific words, it is accepting by faith the righteousness that Jesus won for us 
and it is putting on his enabling power. Um, that, that's 11, correct. <laughs> Philippians 3, 18 to 21. Would someone like to read that? Go ahead, Annette. How do improper values make us enemies of Christ and his cross? Evan. And one thing that you said there, um, you spoke about citizenship heaven, and then you spoke about if our attention is on these improper values, the result could be hell. Stop and think about that, right? Heaven and hell are the exact opposites. They are diametrically opposed. Um, improper values and God's values are diametrically opposed. Um, there is this sinister aspect of our sinful nature that wants to think that we can do both. That we can give ourselves a little bit to improper values and at the same time still give ourselves to God's values. But in the same way that, that our Lord says you cannot serve both God and money, we cannot have improper values and proper values receiving the same attention. And, and therefore we recognize it's an enemy of Christ and the cross because ultimately an improper value becomes one's God. An improper value becomes one's God. You can't understand the words I'm saying? An improper value becomes one's God. One's God. A person's God. There's no middle ground when it comes to, to following our Lord. Uh, think about how our Savior himself said, either you are for me or you are against me. And, and you've heard me use the illustration before. You know, just, just imagine if, if, your, if your wife said to you or if you said to your, your wife, you know, I've, I've got this girl on the side or I've got this guy on the side, but don't worry, I still love you just as much as I love them. You wouldn't go for it. It wouldn't fly. You can't love both of them the same amount. Um, we can't love the improper value the same amount as the godly value or vice versa. Um, we're going to eat one or the other. And, and really the key there in that verse, Philippians 3, in the middle there, you know, 
what is it that makes them an enemy of the cross of Christ? They are thinking only about earthly things. That word only is important. Um, But let us not soften the serious nature of or the insidious nature of or the deadly nature of an improper value. Of thinking that, well, it's just a minor little thing. An improper value is opposed to God's values. Plain and simple. Question 13. Discuss the message of the following passages and their implications for our everyday life. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. Also, do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. So what implications for our everyday life does that that have? Well, let's break it apart a little bit. Um, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. Oh, R- Rudy, you got a thought. I, I was concentrating on that uh, section of the last verse. Okay. So that you test and approve So implication for everyday life is? So the, the implication? What do you want me to do, Lord? Right? Um, rather than what do, do I want. Um, and, and test it. Match it up. Compare it to what, what God has to say. Yeah. Evan. Um, kind of touching on the first part of one, talking about the living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, uh, he would be describing a similar situation as to the Old Testament tabernacle, where if you, if you approach the holy place or the most holy place in, a, in an improper or unpleasing manner, you, you, were, you, you died. It was just a, uh, it was a sacred place that, that God would not accept sin or any sort of malpractice. And we see throughout scripture when some of the Levites or people who weren't from the tribe of it you go back to the Old Testament properly, but I'm not so sure that here's the case so much of this idea of a threat. I mean, that, that idea of an individual dying is, is much more of a, a, a law application of it. Um, but notice how this starts, in view of God's mercy. Um, he really is taking out that aspect of a fear. He's taking out this aspect of it being a law requirement. And he's saying, let the mercy of God, let the grace of God be this ray of sunshine that, that really is filtering down on every aspect of your life at all, all times and everything that you are doing. But let's go back to the Old Testament real quickly. The Israelite who brought the animal sacrifice to the, to the temple, to the tabernacle, what was being symbolized as that animal was brought and it was placed there as maybe a burnt offering? It's really saying now, Lord, this is yours. Do you get the picture? Yep, but, but notice the picture. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. What are we saying? My body, Lord, is yours. And where does my body go with me? Everywhere. And what do I do with my body? Everything. 
Therefore, as I go about my day-to-day life, offering my body as a living sacrifice, I am offering up myself in everything that I do, everywhere I am, to the Lord. It's a beautiful picture. Um, Offer your body as a living sacrifice. And, and that certainly helps us stay away from the idea of, of compartmentalizing our Christian life, right? Our Christian faith. Of, of saying, when I'm around other Christians, I'll be a Christian. Um, when I'm in church, I'll act like a Christian. But when I'm not, then I can, or when I'm in the privacy of my own home, or when, uh, you know how, how easy it is to kind of think, I can let my hair down here now, can't I? Um, but... Nowhere, I, everywhere I go, I'm, I am the Lord's, and I'm happy to, to be. I'm happy to be the Lord's everywhere. Let's take the next passage. Would someone like to read Titus 2, 11 to 14? Go ahead, Karen. So, implications for our everyday life in that passage. <clears throat> of course, I have the advantage of looking at it for five, ten minutes, you know, um, and then I ask you a question and I'm waiting for an answer within 30 seconds. So, I realize, I realize that. Um, Rudy. Yeah, and in that sentence, I think there's even another word that, that perhaps is, is just as vital, and it's the, second, the first and second word. It trains. What, what is the it? Yeah, the grace of God. But, but what is it ultimately another way of saying? Where do we find the grace of God? In his word. Um, it's ultimately another way of saying be in the Word, because what does the Word train you to do? The Word of God trains you to reject these things. What's the implication for everyday life? Guess where we need to be. We need to be in the thing that trains us. It so trains us to do the things that the Lord wants us to be doing. Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, a very similar passage, right? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for training, for rebuking, for correcting. Um, it's, tr- it's useful for absolutely everything in our life. It trains us. It trains us to say no to these things. It trains us to say yes to these things. This passage is just total gospel motivation, isn't it? Um, God provides the grace. He provides the reason. He provides the power. And, and then don't forget some of those beautiful biblical words that we read over, but we just kind of read over them because we're so used to them. Um, he gave himself for us to redeem us. What does redeem mean? To buy back because we've been set free, right? What are we set free from? We're set free from, we're bought back from guilt, power of the devil, power of our sin flesh, set free from the power of sin. Beautiful. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Would someone like to read those verses? Go ahead, Jeff. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? And what agreement does Christ have with 
Belial, or what does a believer share in common with an unbeliever? And what mutual agreement does God's temple have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will live and walk among you. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Implications for our Christian everyday life. Penny. We're not supposed to, uh, we're supposed to stand out, so to speak. We're not supposed to um, be like unbelievers in the world. We should be doing what God says we should be doing. Yeah, there should, there should be a, a noticeable difference. We, we pray there's a noticeable difference um, in, in the way that we, we live our lives, that it's demonstrating this aspect of our faith um, and not a, an unequal yoke or a, an unholy yoking with the, the things of this world. Gemma. Yep. What, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Yeah. And it's, it's just a bunch of different ways throughout the, throughout the verses of really saying light doesn't have anything to do with darkness. Um, righteousness doesn't have anything to do with lawlessness. Um, if you're righteous, if you're light, if you're in Christ then you really aren't to be have anything to do with darkness or with lawlessness or Belial, which is just another name for Satan. Um, and you know, here's, here's, here's some of the thoughts that came to my mind as, as I, I thought of this, is we need to evaluate, don't we, our friendship with the world. We need to evaluate the people we hang out with. Well, and it says something about it too. When, like my coworkers before, and they they've been talking about maybe a movie they saw or something, and they said, "Yeah, it was really funny, but we know you wouldn't like it because there was a lot of foul language in it." And so they knew they knew there was a difference. Yeah. And, and not only did they know the difference, um, the wonderful thing is, is that in your evaluating of your friendship with the world, that evaluation wasn't only with people, it's also with the entertainment I expose myself to. Um, what do I expose myself to when it comes to music? What do I expose myself to when it comes to entertainment, movies. What do I expose myself to? Um, we need to be evaluating those things. Um, you know, it's, it's been said that, you know, rock and roll will kill you quickly and country will kill you slowly. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of truth to that when you stop and think about it. Um, and I, I just think about, about some of the, you know, just you like to have something playing in the, in the car when you're driving around and you're taking a, a, lengthy, a lengthy ride. Um, but boy, listen to the songs. And what are they talking about? Um, at what point do those songs make me callous to the sins they're talking about? Um, I know entertainment can very easily do that. Um, I know that entertainment has done that to me in the past, where, where I didn't think twice about what I was watching. Rather, I laughed at the joke, which was crude and improper, because I just got so used to it. Um, and, and we need to be evaluated. And guess what? As I think I said this uh, maybe last week or a few weeks ago, is there's a part of it that says, but that, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, guess what? It's going to be hard sometimes to give up some of the things that, that our, our sinful nature is, is attached to or that we have found enjoyable over, over the years to give it up because I recognize this isn't God-pleasing. This is leading me down a path that, that really puts a, a value on something of this world. This is, un, this is yoking me um, 
in an improper way to the things and the ways of this world. We need to be, be so, so very careful. Um, what are the things that we participate in? Well, you can offer um, suggestions that are you know, things you can maybe do that are not against what God says. You know, like we had um, co-workers of mine that um, they would go out to bars, but we don't go out to bars. And so we said, you know, well, do you want to meet us maybe for dinner some night? And so then we get together and Yeah, and 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 as we and as we um, evaluate those things too, is is there's a lot of that aspect. Is is could a Christian go into a bar um, and and have a drink and and not necessarily be being yoked with the unbelieving world? It's it's a possibility, but there's also the truth of the matter of of sometimes um, if somebody knows that they can't walk into a bar and stop with one drink well, then they ought not be going to that bar. Or, or if they are going to then just chum it up with the boys who um, have all sorts of different conversations about this, that, and the other thing, um, well, then I need to, to, to be careful too. And, and it, does it mean that I'm, I'm out of the loop a little bit with the, with the boys and I, I lose a little favor with them? It, it might be. Um, but yeah, there's, there are ways that we can do things that are not improper, but we do need to evaluate because sometimes there's that, that mindset that, well, if God doesn't forbid it, it must mean it's okay for me to do it. And that's not always the case. Um, just because it says don't do it, it doesn't mean that I should do it. Rudy. And if you continue from that section that you, you read and where you stopped, notice the strong language too, right? Come out from them. Be separate. Touch no unclean thing. Um, there's no compromising in those words. I've often wondered if we had been in the shoes of Lot and his wife and were told, leave and don't look back. Would we have looked back because I would have lost what I felt was so important to me, the things of this world? Um, so easy to become attached to the things of this world. Um, so easy to make that our goal. But if the Lord said, give up everything, am I ready to do so? Yes, Gemma. Certainly, it, it deals with trust. Um, it deals with faith. It's, it's trusting that the rewards and the blessings the Lord has for us um, in heaven are far greater than anything that we can ever have in this life. Turning the page, question 14. <clears throat> Two items in particular create conflict between godly values and the values of the world, um, money and sex. Read through the Gospels sometime um, and just count up the times that Jesus in his, in his condemning sins or speaking of sins talks about money and sex. It's, it's more than all the others. He knows human nature well. Um, 
react to and discuss the following statements. Sure, some have more and some have less. God has given us more so we can share it with those less fortunate. Good, bad, yay, nay. Why, why not? Um, I'm talking about possessions. Yep. Good, bad. Jeff. I think in general, it's a good attitude for a Christian to kind of have this, to want to share with those less fortunate. We certainly have to share with us, especially in this country. I mean, we're a wealthy nation. Even with the economy and the bank, such as it is right now, we're still a very wealthy nation. Yeah. And we are a, a wealthy nation people, too, um, even if we aren't making, making as much. But, you know, you, you think about it. I, I saw just an article the other day that the mascot for the, the Denver Nuggets, the, the basketball team, makes $600,000 a year. The mascot, the mascot does. Um, and, but, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing is, is how frequently is it in a case of kind of coming back to your statement is, boy, how come I don't get to make that much money? Um, maybe, boy, I, I need to make more money. Um, some have more, some have less. Um, the Lord has given me an abundance. He's given me abundance for the purpose of not thinking about me, but thinking of others. Um, it's interesting, I just had a conversation with, with a, a gentleman in, in one, of, one of our um, members within the um, prison system here, just yesterday, and we were talking about the, the selfishness and how so frequently um, conversations and, and things that we, that we do um, really turn around back to ourselves. We'll talk about it in great detail this coming Sunday when we talk about um, God lived life and our life lived for others, a life of service. Um, so frequently we look and say, well, how can somebody serve me? rather than how can I serve someone else. I'm second one. The only hope for the world lies in true Christianity or total, total, total there you go, totalitarianism. I got the emphasis on the wrong section. Um, either the people of the world brought to faith in Christ learn to share with one another out of love or they share with one another under the gun. Totalitarianism, yes, totalitarianism, there you go. <laughs> Just say it fast and nobody can, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's one of those things where you, you can practice a word as much as you want, and then when it gets to that point, like, like conscience at times has gotten me. Uh, this, how do you, how do you, anyways, it's not getting us anywhere in our study, Evan. So we shouldn't expect the government. We shouldn't expect the government to do yes. that which only the gospel can do. Um, and and that's actually a really valuable thing for us to keep in mind too when it when it comes to um, how we view the government and what we think about when it comes to to voting. Um, doesn't mean that we we don't hope that the Lord will bring some blessings. Um, but we, we do need to be really careful that we, we, we stay away from a mindset that says, well, I'll vote for this individual because this individual will make all the changes. I'm, I remember, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere along the stretch between here and Watertown 
that there is a sign um, that is along the side of the road that says something to the effect of, it, it obviously was when, when Trump was, was running, um, vote Trump, God sent him. Um, you know, and no, the, the government isn't going to do what, what only the gospel can do. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, is can, can Christianity, can the word of God change people? Absolutely, it can. Um, what we need to do is continue to share the word of God. Will we ever have a utopian society in this world? No, no, we won't. Um, third one, the sexual revolution promised to make sex better for everyone. But sex today has become cheap, a meaningless activity engaged in by people who neither value themselves nor others. Good, bad, yay, nay. Why? Is a sad truth. And that last portion of that statement is really valuable for us to keep in mind, too. Um, really, when it comes down to it, it is an aspect of not valuing oneself as much as not valuing the other. Um, isn't, it, isn't it so true that Satan's deceptive way of working is so often like this. He, he comes to us with the same lie he came to Adam and Eve with. God's holding out on you. He's not really as good as he says he is. Why don't you actually have a little bit of freedom and do what you want to do? And then the moment that we fall into that, then he turns around and becomes the accuser. I can't believe you did that. Do you really think that God would forgive you for that? Um, do you really think that the Lord will still welcome you back? Um, he sold the lie on sex to the world. Uh, and guess what? That lie, he works to try and get us to believe too. Um, we see it in the world. We see it in the world in the way that, that people are living together um, in, in just any old manner. And then when they're ton, done with one partner, they move on to another partner. Um, you see it in the aspects of people going to the bars for the very purpose of hooking up for the night, and, and that's all they're looking for. And they're perfectly fine with it. Um, you see it in the aspects of the, the, the pornography and, and those type of things that are in this world. Um, but really, ultimately... It's a lack of valuing oneself, and a lack of valuing the other, and a lack of valuing God's values above um, our own. Yes, Gemma. Did you say God put him there? God didn't put him there. The devil. He created angels, and the devil disobeyed and rebelled, and then he he came. Down there by Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, so um, why did why did God why did God uh, let the devil tempt Adam and Eve? Did he already know what the outcome was going to be? The question really needs to be changed. And that is, did God give Adam and Eve everything they needed to resist any temptation? And the answer to that is, yes. So, so ultimately, the question isn't, why this, why that, or why the other thing? The question is, did God give Adam and Eve everything they needed to remain firm and to say no to everything that Satan tempted him with? And the answer is yes. But I'm not capable in my age and my state to stay in the correct way. And, and, I'm not, and I'm not, my reversing it on the, with a question to you is, is not meant to say that you should know this. It's my instructive method. Uh, but it's, it's my method of seeking to instruct. Um, rather than just saying, um, let's think about it together. 
other type of thing. Yeah, um, and, and so we, we look at this and, you know, once again, we need to remember is that ultimately we think one way and then we apply that to our Lord. But let's remember that everything that we think and everything that we say in, in our application to the Lord's way of acting, all of our thinking is tainted by sin. And so we can't even begin to, to properly put a perspective on those things because everything that we think is tainted by sin. Um, and, and ultimately, we're not in the position to, to question God. But, but like I said, the far better way to look at it is, did God lack in anything as far as giving to Adam and Eve what they needed? And the answer is no. Um, the fault lies not with God. The fault lies with Adam and Eve. Yes? Um, and, and once again, my, my statement is not meant to make you feel guilty because you don't need to feel guilty. Well, I, I, correct, but, but the reason I say that too is because you feel the need to apologize to your Savior because of what I said. What I said is not meant to make you feel guilty. Um, what I'm saying is, is the aspect of saying it's valuable for us to keep in mind as we go about is, is all right, let me be careful to try and put my way of thinking and make it be his way of thinking too. Um, yeah, yes, you can apologize to him, but um, at the same time, I don't think that you need to feel guilty for the question that you asked. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, and, and it does fit in with that, that comment, too, is, is why, why is it that abortion is, is sometimes so um, appealing is because people don't want to be tied down and so they don't, don't have to give up the values that they, they have, whether it be um, a sexual promis promiscuity or whether it be even just the chasing after whatever dream they might have. And in general, they won't because they don't want to frame it that way. Moving on to the next one there. Since it is all just good entertainment, a Christian can, in good conscience, subscribe to R-rated cable programming and to printed material that sensationalizes sex by being selective in reading and viewing. Annette. What does light have to do with darkness, right? Diametrically opposed. Um, you stop and you consider um, that statement and everything that we looked at ahead of time. We're clothed with Christ. Wouldn't that not be um, walking through the mud with the wedding dress? Um, we're not to be enemies of the cross. Well, if... God's values and those values are completely opposite. Doesn't that make us an enemy of the cross? Um, think about what we looked in that last passage. Separate yourself from them. Come out of them. Don't touch anything unclean. Um, yeah, they're opposed. Page 9, 1 Timothy 6. But you, O man of God... Flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many 
witnesses. List the good values Paul set down for Timothy that we will benefit from by adopting them. And, and maybe it's not even so much as, as a value that you see there as it is his encouragement of what to do in chasing the values that God wants. Annette. Yeah, um, key word oftentimes are, are the verbs in sentences, right? Hold to, like you said. Um, what, are, what are some other of those verbs that you see in those, those two verses that, that really are speaking to that? Fleeing from. Fighting. Fighting, yeah. And we even have at the end of the first line, pursue. Don't just flee one thing, but flee one thing and pursue another thing. Um, anyone remember where this is coming from in 1 Timothy? Um, Timothy has, Paul has just said to them, um, godliness with contentment is great gain. We read the, the lesson in Sunday services last week. Um, those who want to be rich fall into a trap and into all sorts of evil desires. Many who have chased after the riches of this world have fallen away from the faith. Then you go, flee from these things. Flee from those values and pursue these ones. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Philippians 3. But whatever things were a profit for me, these things I have come to consider a loss because of Christ. But even more than that, I consider everything to be a loss because of what is worth far more, knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have lost all things and consider them rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God by faith. I do this so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. So what values of Paul are worthy of adoption? Rudy. So take that thought. The focus is and the goal is, the value is in knowing Christ. Which means that everything else then becomes a loss. Well, and even goes far as to say it's, it's rubbish. It's, it's not worth anything. Wouldn't or couldn't we say that um, Paul's words here are kind of saying, if, if whatever I do and whatever I pursue, if the goal is only a profit to me, that ultimately yeah, that's a loss. If the profit is only for me. Um, and and here's, here's the thing. We don't want to take these words and say that everything um, and every value is wrong in and of itself. It's not. But if what I value then affects my relationship with the Savior, it becomes wrong. The Lord tells us to value our family. The Lord tells us to value um, the, the blessings he's given to us in this world. The Lord tells us to, to value um, our health. But if the pursuit of all of those values affects my relationship with Christ, then I've got to consider them differently. That's rubbish. 17. How, if any, have your values listed at the beginning of this lesson 
changed as you worked through this material. Brad. Yeah. Um, and, and, and isn't that the reason why the sinful flesh and Satan hate true repentance? And why um, that sincere repentance is such a wonderful club against Satan in our flesh? Um, it's the way that we drown the sinful nature every day, as, as, um, as Luther puts it. In, in the section on baptism and in, in on section in confession and repentance. And and I think that if we if you go back and look at the values that we wrote at the beginning, I'm not so sure that it changes our values. It just leads us to say, um, I want to keep them in the proper order, right? Um, Lord help me to keep Keep them in that proper order. Question 18. In what way has this study made you feel uncomfortable about your values and the way you live out your values? Annette. I've made the comment that, um, or at least I've had the thought that as, as the Lord in his grace has led me to, to grow spiritually, the more and more frustrated I get at what I sometimes see in myself. Um, and in one of those aspects of, is, you know, just how, how frequently and how, how much, even when I don't want to, um, it's about me. And, and the, the selfishness that is, is so frequently and so, so constantly there, even when you don't want it to. And, and I've, 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 said, I've made the comment a lot of times, you know, when we put ourselves down, it's oftentimes um, backhanded arrogance or selfishness because we're looking for somebody to build me up. And, and so, yeah, like, like you said, it's, it's, it's a matter of, boy, daily, daily contrition and repentance and daily being in that word so that, that our hearts can be more and more in line with that of, of our Lord. Um, 19, why are the good news of God's forgiveness in Jesus and his promise of strength and help for us important as we test our values? Jeff? We don't have to rely on us to do everything. God is going to give us the strength. Yeah, and that, that forgiveness becomes that enabling power, right? Exactly. And that, and that forgiveness, you know, if you look at the, the other side of that coin, that forgiveness hits so desperately what we need to every day. Yeah. Rudy? Yeah, 
Oh, what a blessing. Um, what a blessing that we have that opportunity to, to gather around the word in, in worship and in Bible studies. And let us not take it for granted, right? Yeah. Any questions? Any comments? Let's close with prayer then. As I said last week, we'll use the same prayer once again this week. Heavenly Father, we confess that our values are often not in line with what you would have them be. Forgive us for Christ's sake, and through your Holy Spirit, lead us to walk in the footsteps of our Savior, who in every way pleased you. For his sake, hear us. Amen. So next week we will begin our um, Let's Go series as we, as we kind of are encouraged and instructed on ways in which we are able to um, grow in our ability to share our faith with others. So that begins next week, Wednesday. Yes, I did say let's go. <laughs>